Welcome back to The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology. This is the 18th uh, presentation in the series, and we're talking today about ventilatory muscle function, part two. So this is The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology. And as you can see, we're moving along here, number 18 out of 30. And we want to approach this with the enthusiasm of a child in a candy shop. So last time we talked about the respiratory balance. So remember we said that in order to sustain adequate ventilation, ventilatory muscle power and central drive must be adequate to overcome the respiratory load. We're focusing really on ventilatory muscle power uh, during this and the next presentation. So today we're going to talk about ventilatory muscle fatigue and endurance. We talked about ventilatory muscle strength last time. We're going to talk about measuring ventilatory muscle endurance and ventilatory muscle training. So skeletal muscle function, remember, can be divided into in, uh, strength, which we discussed last time, and endurance. Ventilatory muscle fatigue is the inability to continue to form work at a certain level. Ventilatory muscle endurance is the opposite, the ability to continue to perform work at a certain level. So if you're working at a certain level and have to stop, that's fatigue. The ability to continue to work is endurance. One needs to have sufficient ventilatory muscle strength to take one breath, but one needs to have sufficient ventilatory muscle endurance to breathe for the rest of your life. So endurance is the ability to keep taking breaths. So muscle output, okay, equals the sum of ventilatory muscle stores and ventilatory or, and energy production. This is actually true for any skeletal muscle. For breathing, because that's a continuous process, we're really not dealing with stores so much. We're dealing with energy production. We can measure transdiaphragmatic pressure. We talked about this last time with an esophageal balloon to measure. Uh, pleural pressure, an uh, intragastric balloon to measure intra-abdominal pressure, and transdiaphragmatic pressure, or the function of the diaphragm, is abdominal minus pleural pressure. Harris Roussas and Peter Macklin published an important study in 1977 that demonstrated that ventilatory muscles, like other skeletal muscles, could fatigue. So what they did was they, first of all, placed intrasophageal and intragastric balloons to measure transdiaphragmatic pressure. They had a system where one had to breathe in through an inspiratory resistance so that they would have to generate um, a significant inspiratory pressure to obtain a breath. Uh, note that they exhaled without any resistance. Then they measured maximal transdiaphragmatic pressure and then set this resistance at given percentages of max PDI. So for example, they might start with somebody breathing at 90% um, of their max uh, transdiaphragmatic pressure or PDI and see how long they could do that, then 80, 70, etc. This is what their experiment looked like. So long as an individual was able to achieve that target, for example here, you can see that they achieved the desired transdiaphragmatic pressure on each breath. When they came to fatigue, they were unable to continue to do this. And so this would be where diaphragm fatigue at this level came into play. So here was the result. So it's plotted here as percent of max PDI and how long an individual could sustain it. So not surprisingly, if this was set at 90% or even 80% of maximum PDI, the subjects could not sustain that very long without fatiguing. But as the max PDI fell, or the, the percent of max PDI fell, they could sustain it longer. And they performed these studies for out, uh, up to 90 minutes. Basically, what this shows is that this is asymptotic, and it's asymptotic at about 40%. So what does this mean? This means that if you have to generate more than 40% of your maximum PDI on every breath, you cannot do that indefinitely. You will fatigue, all right? Uh, which means you're going to respiratory failure. Now you can, you can exceed a PDI over PDI max of 40% in one of two ways. 
you can have a very high respiratory load that requires somebody with a normal diaphragm to just use more of, of that uh, percentage. And by the way, I should say that for most people breathing ordinarily, they're breathing with a, a PDI of about five centimeters of water. So um, a normal max PDI is around 100 or so. So breathe, you know, having to breathe greater than 40% of max PDI is a significant stress over normal. But if you have to do that, if you have normal ventilatory muscles, perhaps you have very serious lung disease that requires you to generate those pressures in order to have adequate ventilation and gas exchange. On the other hand, you might have such severe ventilatory muscle weakness that even breathing normally against a normal respiratory load would be greater than 40% of your maximum, or more commonly somewhere in between some degree of ventilatory muscle weakness so that your max PDI is decreased, but maybe some degree of increased respiratory load, for example, with a pneumonia. They repeated the experiment, breathing a hypoxic mixture of 13% oxygen, that you're breathing 21% oxygen at sea level. So 13% oxygen is between the equivalent of between eight and uh, 10,000 feet elevation. And you can see that the uh, that the amount of uh, pressure that they could sustain was significantly decreased uh, in the hypoxic situation compared to the normoxic situation. So hypoxia decreases the threshold of the max PDI you can generate even further. So you don't just have a diaphragm to breathe, you also have intercostal accessory muscles. So they repeated this experiment, in this case using a measure of maximum inventory pressure, which is barometric minus airway pressure. And in this case, this would be a measure of combined inventory muscle strength. So here they had the same experimental setup. They had inventory resistance. They measured the maximum inventory pressure and then set a target for different percentages of the maximum inventory pressure and saw how long a subject could sustain that. And here is a curve. So you can see this case is mouth pressure over maximum mouth pressure, all right, inventory pressure that is. And you can see that in this case, the asymptote was actually at about 60%. I realize this looks like 50 for this subject, but the paper, um, their published paper says 60%. So what this means is if you have to generate an inspiratory pressure greater than 60% of your max, you cannot do that indefinitely. You will fatigue and go into respiratory failure. Now, what happened here? Why is this number different? So up here is the mouth pressure, which their target that, that, that was by design that they were supposed to achieve. Down here, we have gastric pressure, transiphragmatic pressure, and a soft geo pressure, which also remained fairly constant. But look at PDI. So transiphragmatic pressure was initially up, then it fell then it was up again and fell and so on. So what this says is that during uh, wind breathing at pressures near diaphragm fatigue, basically your diaphragm and your intercostal accessory muscles uh, move back and forth. They're synergistic in a will, if you will. They move back and forth. So at some points in time, you're dealing with your diaphragm. At other times, you're using your uh, intercostal accessory. And the analogy here is like a woman or a man carrying a heavy suitcase down the street. In this case, she will carry the su suitcase in her right hand for a while. Her right hand will start to tire. She'll move to her left hand. When, her left, when, when the suitcase being carried in her left hand, her right hand is recovering. Her left hand is, re is tiring. And then when it gets su sufficiently tired, she'll move it back to the right back and forth, all right? Similarly, near diaphragm fatigue, subjects switch from breathing predominantly with the diaphragm to breathing predominantly with intercostal and accessory muscles and back and forth. When the diaphragm fatigues, you move to intercostal accessories. When they fatigue, you move back to the diaphragm. So this only happens at levels near diaphragm fatigue. So ventilatory muscles are skeletal muscles and they can fatigue. One cannot sustain breathing if generating if generating greater than 60% of maximal uh, mouth pressure is required. Uh, patients requiring greater than 60% mouth pressure will fatigue. 
This will cause respiratory failure and hypoxia decreases endurance even more. So what we looked at here was the proportion of maximal tension the diaphragm is generating. But perhaps a more sensitive way to look at this is called the tension time index. So the tension time index equals the PDI that you're generating over your max PDI times the inspiratory time over the total respiratory time. This is called the duty cycle, and it's the percent of time that the diaphragm is contracting. And I think you can see here we have a measure both of the proportion of maximal tension the diaphragm is generating and the proportion of time that the diaphragm is contracting. So here's an example of stable chronic respiratory failure patients admitted to a ventilator weaning unit. The tension time index of those patients are at this cutoff here is the um, is the cutoff between uh, able to sustain adequate ventilation over here and able not able to sustain adequate ventilation up here. So you can see of those patients who could not be weaned in this particular study, all right, the majority of them had a tension time index that exceeded the threshold. On the other hand, of those patients who could successfully be weaned from mechanical assisted ventilation, nearly all of them had a tension time index that was in the range where um, respiratory failure does not occur. That is where ventilation can be sustained. Here's an example of tension time index of the diaphragm in uh, patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And this is plotted versus age. And I think what you can see is that as they age, that is as ventilatory muscle uh, weakness progresses, the tension time index um, increases. So it's higher in everybody at, uh, at a higher age when fatigue is more likely. So the tension time index assesses both the percent of maximum PDI a subject needs to breathe and the percent of the respiratory cycle the diaphragm is contracting. So it's probably a better predictor, predictor of fatigue than measuring transdiaphragmatic pressure alone. So how can we measure ventilatory muscle endurance? So this is the hospital for sick children at a time when I was a postdoctoral fellow there in what I refer to as the golden era. It was actually the 100th anniversary of the hospital, as you can see here. For an experiment we're going to describe shortly, we developed this device to measure uh, ventilatory muscle endurance. So basically, we have a subject on a mouthpiece. There's a tube here in a bag where somebody rebreathes, okay? And the reason is we're going to measure the highest ventilation that these individuals could, could achieve. And if they just simply breathed at 100 liters per minute or so, uh, they would pass out. So we needed to preserve CO2. We had a CO2 scrubber. Uh, we had O2 and CO2 analyzers. We could vary the amount of gas going through here to keep the CO2 constant. Because this is a closed system, they're consuming oxygen. So we had an oxygen reservoir and an oxygen inflow regulator to keep uh, the adequate amount of oxygen. So what happens is we have an airflow generator here. It's filling a spirometer at a certain rate. When the subject inspires, they collapse this bag in a box, which draws air inward. And then when he exhales, he or she exhales, it goes out through a one-way valve this direction. So basically, the subject has to breathe enough minute ventilation to keep up with the airflow generator and keep the spirometer at a constant level. Uh, this is actually a little bit more detailed uh, drawing of, of this apparatus, uh, which you can see was um, uh, relatively sophisticated. Uh, the inspiratory resistance of this system was constant and did not change with flow rate, which is important, and low, by the way. Uh, this is a picture of the apparatus, and this is a subject actually performing the test. And I think you can see he is not exercising in terms of running, but he is exercising his respiratory muscles. Um, and as one who's involved in this study as a subject, I can tell you that this is a very interesting feeling. In the same way that if you jog, for some period of time and come back, all the muscles that you were using in jogging, you can feel they hurt. In this, all the muscles you are using to generate increased ventilation, you can feel. So you feel your intercostal accessory muscles, you feel 
um, uh, your diaphragm, etc. All of these um, you can tell immediately what's going on. And I think you can see this guy is working pretty hard, even though he's uh, uh, not running. Uh, he's working pretty hard just by ventilatory muscles and generating uh, this uh, sort of activity. We've initially measured the maximal voluntary ventilation, or MVV, which is the largest amount that somebody can breathe. It's, it's performed over 12 seconds, normalized to 60 uh, seconds or a minute. And you get a value which represents the theoretical mechanical maximum that somebody can ventilate. So what we did, similar to the Roussos and Macklin protocol, is we uh, set the, spirom the spirometer, which was our target, at different percentages of the maximal voluntary ventilation. So for example, at 90%, uh, the individual could sustain this for only a few minutes. And gradually, we went out to 15 minutes. And you can see that this, again, was asymptotic. And it was at about 67% or so, uh, not quite 70%. Of, um, of the MVV could be sustained indefinitely. Or put another way, if you had to breathe more than 70% of your maximum voluntary ventilation, you could not sustain that indefinitely and you would fatigue. One of the problems, we, we wanted to measure um, the uh, MSVC, maximal sustainable ventilatory capacity, in normal subjects and in patients with cystic fibrosis. So how do we compare measures in people with different degrees of lung disease? So the MSVC, maximum sustainable vol uh, voluntary capacity, is measured in liters per minute. And this obviously is going to be, obviously is going to be affected by lung disease. So um, somebody with CF, for example, will not have the same MSVC because they have mechanical limitation to their, to their ventilation. So what we opted to do was to give normal volunteers lung disease and use the correction that remains the most constant. So how could we do that? Expiratory flow is related to gas density. Okay, We can create lung disease in an individual by having them breathe a dense gas. Remember before when we talked about a test of small airway function, we talked about the volume of isoflow with helium. And there we said that flow in the large and middle-sized airways being uh, density dependent because of turbulent flow, we could increase flow with a less dense gas. Conversely, by giving a denser gas, we can um, decrease flow and, if you will, create lung disease. So we use sulfur hexafluoride, which is a very dense gas indeed. So some of you may be aware that if you, if you breathe helium um, and then speak, you sound like Donald Duck. It's a very high-pitched thing. If you breathe sulfur hexafluoride, uh, which is a very dense gas, and then speak, you are real basso profundo. You have a very, very low voice. But these are flow volume curves from an individual breathing air and breathing SF6. And you can see that this curve is flattened indeed, indicating there's significantly decreased flow. Or if you will, we've created chronic obstructive disease or acute obstructive disease. So the question is, what's the best correction? So three subjects here. Uh, this is the absolute value of their MSVC, and you see it obviously decreased with SF6, meaning that we were successful at creating lung disease. If we express that as a percent of MVV, it was a pretty good correction. But we felt that expressing it as a uh, FEV ones per minute was even a better correction. So this is what we used in the subsequent studies. So correcting MSVC liters per minute by FEV1 showed the most consistent value between normal and disease in the same individual. Therefore, we expressed MSVC as FEV1 per second. This was the best way to account for variations in lung disease, but give a consistent measure of ventilatory muscle endurance. Using pressure instead of minute ventilation obviates the need for this correction. And we'll return to uh, this correction. So we're going to apply this shortly. So Bruce Nickerson, who was a postdoctoral fellow in pediatric pulmonology, 1979 to 81, basically devised this system. And I have to be honest, when he first uh, presented this idea, I was skeptical that it worked, that it would work. But his father was an engineer, 
he built it anyway, and it turned out to be a great advance. So here's our apparatus for ventral terminal cylinders. So patient is uh, or subject is put on a mouthpiece here. Uh, in order to get air, so there's a plunger that occludes an opening in the bottom of this chamber, right? And we can put weights in this chamber, on this plunger to vary it. So the subject is going to have to generate a negative pressure to lift this plunger to get air, right? Exhaling goes out through a one-way valve again. All right, so you get the idea? If we put more weight on this plunger, you have to generate more negative pressure to lift this plunger and allow uh, inspiratory air to come in. We first showed that the weight that you put on the plunger was linearly proportional to what we call the threshold pressure in centimeters of water. We also showed that once you opened the, uh, the opening in the bottom by um, lifting the plunger, that flow was independent of that pressure. The good thing about that is it means that in this test, somebody could get as much air as they needed. It was not dependent on the pressure that they were generating, assuming that they achieved that critical pressure and opened it. And this shows um, an example of pressure, uh, fractions uh, of exhaled CO2. And you can see that in this case, fatigue was, was uh, quite um, precisely determined. The reason is, if even subject like myself who knew what was going on, if I couldn't get about one or two breaths, I basically came off. So the end point, the precision point, was very precise by using this particular technique. You can see that CO2 went up a little bit there. So this is a picture of a subject uh, performing this study, and you can see she's breathing along here. And she is also working, um, like the, um, the uh, man that we showed with the previous study. So this is the curve that we got. So again, we designed this, we put weights in so that we were uh, designating pressures very near maximum sort of pressure. And uh, as we gradually decreased the pressure, one was able to sustain it for a longer period of time. And the truth of the matter was, now this is combined in storm muscle strength, what we called sustainable inspiratory pressure, what could be sustained for 10 minutes was 68% of the, of the maximum inspiratory pressure. So what this shows is that if you have to generate greater than 68% of your maximal pressure, you will fatigue. You will not be able to sustain that uh, indefinitely. And this was a pretty tight uh, number here for a number of subjects across different ages. The other thing that's nice about this is we measured oxygen consumption. Now we will talk about uh, oxygen consumption when we talk about exercise, that ox maximal oxygen consumption is the measure of exercise fitness. Here we measured oxygen consumption with um, doing uh, different percentages of SIP, that is the sustainable inventory pressure. And what you see here is that as one increased pressure up to SIP, the, the O2 consumption increased. But achieving beyond that, uh, one literally achieved maximum O2 consumption with ventilatory muscles at sustainable inventory pressure. So sustainable inventory pressure was not only a measure of when fatigue might occur, but it also correlated with the maximal oxygen consumption of the respiratory muscles, indicating there was a true measure of endurance. So ventilatory muscle endurance can be measured as the sustainable inspiratory capacity or pressure. Uh, SIP is a fraction of maximum inspiratory pressure that can be sustained for 10 minutes, which is essentially indefinitely. SIP correlates with maximum oxygen consumption of the ventilatory muscles, and therefore it represents resistance to fatigue. So strength is related to cross-sectional area of muscle and it is measured as the maximum pressure generated. Endurance is related to the ability to perform work without fatigue and it is related to muscle energy production. There are contributors to diaphragm fatigue. Hypoxia, as we saw, will uh, decrease endurance. Hypercapnion acidosis interfere with excitation coupling of actinosomycin in the muscle cells and decrease endurance. Malnutrition not only decreases uh, muscle bulk or strength, 
but also decreases the oxidative enzymes in muscles, decreasing energy production. Hyperinflation, we talked about, um, puts the diaphragm in a mechanical disadvantage. We will talk about development and infancy. Increased respiratory loads, we talked about, and disuse. Uh, many times we're consulted to see somebody in an intensive care unit who's not been able to be weaned from a ventilator for a month or perhaps longer. So that individual already also has disuse changes in skeletal muscle. So can we train ventilatory muscles? Can we train muscles to be stronger and or have more endurance? So Lethan Bradley at the Harvard School for Public Health uh, published an important paper where they separated ventilatory muscle strength and endurance measurements and showed that one could uh, separately do ventilatory muscle strength training in normal individuals and ventilatory muscle endurance training in normal individuals. So for strength training, subjects performed repeated static inspiratory and expiratory um, maneuvers against an occluded airway five days a week. For ventilatory muscle endurance training, they performed normal capnic hypertonia 35 to 40 minutes a day, five days a week. And here were the results. Here's an example from a subject of ventilatory muscle strength trainers. And you can see that uh, what's plotted here is percent of, of total lung capacity versus the pressure. And you can see subjects did increase both their inspiratory and expiratory pressures compared to their baseline. The ventilatory muscle endurance apparatus was similar to the one I described from Toronto in that subjects breathed in and out. They had a target sort of a system here. In this case, they had to keep this bag flat um, and uh, minute ventilation was measured. And um, you can see here that uh, these subjects had um, uh, this curve prior to training. This is uh, liters per minute now. Um, and obviously the top here is going to be their uh, maximal voluntary ventilation. And this is the percent of time they could sustain it prior to training and after training. So a significant improvement. Uh, this just shows that the um, uh, strength trainers improved maximum pressure with strength training. Endurance training, it didn't really affect and controls no effect. The endurance for endurance training, um, the 15 minute maximal voluntary ventilation here is what they refer to it as. Strength trainers had no change. The endurance trainers had a change and controls uh, did not have a change. At the hospital for sick children again, uh, this is me, this is my mentor, Henry Lovison, uh, Meyer Catan and Craig Mellis, who are prominent pediatric pulmonologists in their own right, who were fellows with me at the time. So during my fellowship, the median survival for CF patients was around late adolescence, 17, 18, maybe 20 years of age. There was an interesting observation at the uh, Cystic Fibrosis Center at the Hospital for Sick Children at that time. And that was if we looked at the percent of surviving patients with CF, okay, in the first decade, there was a slight female preponderance, about 60% were females. 40% males. In the second decade, 50-50, and above age 20, there was a significant decrease in females down to about 30% and increase in males to about 70%. Now, it turns out that males and females lose lung function at the same rate. So this did not explain the difference, all right? The lung function was the same, all right? So the question is, why do males seem to have a survival advantage past age 20 compared to females? So if you remember the respiratory balance, what we hypothesize is that cystic fibrosis is associated with an increased respiratory load. That is, they have obstructive airway disease, and presumably this is more of a stress on ventilatory muscles. So the question is, does this increased respiratory load increase 
uh, or serve as a training stress to ventilatory muscles to increase their ventilatory muscle power. So in order to do this, we use the apparatus that I described earlier to measure ventilatory muscle endurance as a proportion of maximum voluntary ventilation, the highest minute ventilation that they could sustain um, for 20 minutes in this case. And here again, this guy is working uh, when he's doing this study. And this is the normal curve, as you recall. Uh, you can sustain maximum sustainable ventilatory capacity about 68% or so of your maximal voluntary ventilation. So we looked at, to answer this question, we looked at cystic fibrosis males and females. And you can see their age was not different. Their percent predicted FEV1 was not different. And percent predicted MMEF, mid-maximum upstairs flow rate, which is what we currently call the FEF 2575. Not different between males and females. These are the data. So this is the MSVC in absolute value liters per minute. So this is normal or control males, control females, which were a bit less than males. And then for CF, CF males and CF females. And again, there was a difference here uh, between males and females. When we corrected this with MSVC measured as percent of maximum voluntary ventilation, Interestingly, there was no difference between males and females in the normals. But there still was a, a bit of a difference or an increase in the, in the MSVC for males versus females with CF. And when we looked at MSVC as FEV1s per minute, remember our preferred method, again, no difference between males and females in controls, but males did have an increase compared to females. So it looks at least like males with CF have an increased ventilatory muscle endurance compared to females. And, you know, at least possible that this may explain their survival. So basically what we showed is that it does appear that the increased respiratory load in CF increases ventilatory muscle power. So the question is, could we increase it further? And might that be beneficial to these uh, patients? This was ventilatory muscle training that we did on normal subjects, more normal subjects. So basically, these individuals breathe at maximum, as high a, a, a minute ventilation as they could for 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Right? And you can see that everybody over a six week period increased their maximum sustainable ventilatory capacity just by doing this uh, endurance training. Um, over the course of the whole week. People started with different lung capacities here, but they all increased. We had some controls, and the controls, of course, did not show any change before and after, whereas the ventilatory muscle trainers did. Unfortunately, like other muscle training, if you stop training, you lose the training effect. So here the subject trained for um, six weeks, and then they were measured after stopping training two, four, six, eight, ten, and one year following training, and you can see that they return back to baseline if they did not continue training. So what about the CF patients? Although their ventilatory muscle power is already increased, can we increase it further? So these are L.A. Wanamaker and Inez uh, Krestinch, who were both uh, physical therapists who actually performed this study at a cystic fibrosis camp where we had subjects uh, for a month. And these are the results of the MSVC on the cystic fibrosis patients who trained for four weeks. And you can see that all four of them increased their MSVC. This one was a little weird, but all of them increased their MSVC with training time. Interestingly, the percent change in MSVC after training was much higher for the CF patients than it was for the normal subjects. All of them increased their training, but the CF patients had an even greater increase, presumably because they were also training against their baseline increased respiratory load. We had a control group at the camp, and it turned out this group was just measured at the beginning and end of the month camp. It turned out that these, what we referred to as physical activity trainers, also increased. 
So why was this the case? Well, what were these kids doing at camp? It turns out that what they were doing a lot was swimming and canoeing, upper body exercise. And so inadvertently, unfortunately, we think that our quote unquote control subjects actually were being trained um, by physical activity, specifically upper body physical activity. So this shows the CF inlateral muscle trainers versus the physical activity trainers. Their oxygen was the same, FEV1 was the same, and MMAF was the same, right? But as you can see, uh, both groups increased their MSVC before and after the training period. This is actually good news because I will tell you that a specific ventilatory muscle training is a very, very tedious activity and hardly anybody is gonna do this for any length of time. So the fact that we could achieve similar results with physical activity, specifically other upper body physical activity like swimming, canoeing, et cetera, um, is actually good news because it means if we try to promote exercise and especially upper body exercise, one of the things that we are likely doing is increasing ventilatory muscle endurance. So uh, this just shows the overall percent. These are the normal controls. Their increase in ventilatory muscle training, and then the CF patients, ventilatory muscle trainers, and physical activity trainers. So in fact, it does look like we can further increase ventilatory muscle power um, by a specific training program, which will increase it even more than the standard uh, respiratory load in patients with cystic fibrosis. Increased respiratory loads in CF is a training stress for ventilatory muscles. CF patients have increased ventilatory muscle endurance. Ventilatory muscle endurance can be increased in normal subjects with specific training. Ventilatory muscle endurance can be in further increased in CF with specific training and upper body physical activity can improve ventilatory muscle endurance as well as specific training in CF patients. But this is so effort dependent. I mean, can we prove that muscle training occurs in lung disease in some other way? So uh, while I was a fellow in Toronto, I happened to make the acquaintance of C. David Inuzo, who was a muscle physiology, uh, basically a basic scientist. And he suggested that we could do the same thing on rats. And so what we did was to take rats and give them a training stress, a ventilatory muscle training stress. So what we did was we took growing rats, young rats, placed a uh, ligature around their trachea uh, loosely. And then as they grew, as the rats grew and their trachea grew, this basically constricted their trachea and kept it stable. So they had a tracheal stenosis. And this therefore was a training stress for the ventilatory muscles. Not only that, but it was a 24 hour day training stress. It was a constant training stress. So uh, basically uh, what we did was we had tracheal banded versus controlled rats. Um, this was their weight after five weeks. Uh, the, the banding, turned out to be a pretty severe respiratory stress. And you can see that these uh, did have a decreased body weight and the tracheal diameter was also uh, decreased. Um, it was about half what the normal was uh, in these rats. This is the ventilatory pattern. So we built this um, chamber here where we could actually measure ventilation in the rats. It works off of pressure differences. Um, and you can see the Control rats had a ventilatory pattern like this. The banded rats adopted a ventilatory pattern which would be characteristic of airway obstruction. That is deep, slow inspiration. We talked about this previously, about how worker breathing is basically, um, the breathing pattern you select is the one that minimizes worker breathing. So in this case, we want slow flows, even if that has to be deeper volumes uh, to achieve this. And this just shows the data Respiratory rates were slower in the banded rats. Inspiratory time increased, tidal volume increased. Minute ventilation was pretty close um, overall. So we measured muscle oxidative enzyme activity. These measures of um, 
of oxidative capacity of muscle were all increased in the banded rats uh, versus the non-banded rats. This is a measure of glycolytic activity, which was not significantly different between the two. So basically, we could increase muscle oxidative enzyme activity uh, by um, imposing a um, training stress on the diaphragm. Skeletal muscle is also composed of muscle fiber types. So there are so-called slow twitch muscle fibers and fast twitch mu muscle fibers. The slow twitch fibers are high in oxidative capacity so that they can produce a lot of energy and are relatively fatigue resistant. Uh, on the other hand, fast twitch fibers have relatively little oxidative capacity. Um, and although they may be able to twitch fast, i.e. in a sprint, uh, they do not have the ability to have uh, endurance or long-term um, long ability to contract. Further, the fast twitch fibers and slow twitch fibers use ATP differently. So the same amount of ATP is used for a fiber to twitch, but for a slow twitch fiber, for the same amount of ATP, you get more tension under the curve here, if you will. And for a relatively slow activity like breathing, this is a more efficient way to breathe. This is something good for your eyelids when you blink quickly. But if you've got a slow activity like breathing, you want to sustain this tension uh, over a period of time and preferably uh, do it efficiently. So this gives us three types of skeletal muscle fiber types in rats, all right? So SO is a high oxidative capacity, that's the O, low glycolytic capacity, slow twitch, and these are fatigue resistant because they have high oxidative capacity and they use um, energy efficiently. There's FOG fibers, which are fast twitch, oxidative and glycolytic. So they have both oxidative and high, high glycolytic um, capacities. They're fast twitch, and they're somewhat intermediate in terms of fatigue. And then FG fibers, fast twitch, glycolytic, low oxidative capacity are fast fatiguing. So what happened in our rats? Basically, what happened was there was a shift from the FG, the fast glycolytic fibers, which were decreased in the banded rats, increased in the controls, through to the SO fibers or slow twitch oxidative fibers, which were increased. Now, this is important because many previous studies that have looked at pretty intense aerobic exercise programs have not really shown a shift in muscle fiber types. We think the reason that we were able to show it here is that our training stress was severe and it was applied 24 hours per day. So this is an important finding for skeletal muscle physiology in general, but also with respect to um, ventilatory muscle endurance. Ventilatory muscle endurance can be increased with specific training. Increased respiratory loads impose a training stress on ventilatory muscles. And uh, this can be seen as increased isocatenic minute ventilation in CF patients, increased oxidative enzyme activity in rat diaphragm and in costal muscles, and a shift in muscle fiber types from fast fatiguing to fatigue resistance in rats. And as I mentioned, it was the first demonstration of muscle fiber type changes with aerobic training stress. So what have we learned? Ventilatory muscle fatigue can occur if one must generate greater than 40% maximum PDI in each breath. Diaphragm fatigue will occur, causing respiratory failure. Ventilatory muscle endurance is resistance to fatigue. Ventilatory muscles can be trained to increase strength and/or endurance. Ventilatory muscle training causes cellular changes. Contributors to diaphragm fatigue are hypoxia hypercapnia and acidosis, malnutrition, hyperinflation, infancy, increased respiratory loads, and disuse. Again, the respiratory balance, ventilatory muscle power must be adequate to overcome the respiratory load in order to sustain adequate ventilation. Next time, we will deal with ventilatory muscle function. Part three, we're going to talk about development and uh, some aspects of respiratory failure
due to ventilatory muscle fatigue. So thanks again to our director and producer, Katie LeWinter, and thank you so much for joining me for the great adventure, pediatric pulmonary physiology.